Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's Zoom event. Tonight's presentation is the second in our fall series, Preparing Our Gardens for Winter. We organize these two talks to inspire you to rethink your annual habit of rigorously cleaning out your garden bed. I am Renee Baranca, the Manager of Conservation Education and Outreach at Western Reserve Land Conservancy. I plan programming year long to help the public garner a greater appreciation of our natural world. I am pleased to continue our collaboration with the Cleveland Pollinator and Native Plant Symposium and Nature Spark to bring you tonight's program. Through this collaboration, we hope to have an impact in transforming backyard gardens and local green spaces into functioning beneficial habitats. My co-hosts, Anne Cicerella and Judy Semmerk, are passionate about this topic also. Anne is the founder of the Cleveland Pollinator Native Plant Symposium. She works to build connections and inspire conversations about the importance of restoring our fragmented native habitat, starting with our own backyards and local community plots of land. Judy possesses a wealth of knowledge about our natural world. Through her company, Nature Spark, she works with children and adults in the realm of nature education and exploration. Judy loves to share her nature knowledge through field trips and public programs, both virtually and in person. I thank them both for working with me to bring you this series. You'll be interested to know that we are thoughtfully planning another winter symposium on inviting biodiversity into our gardens. We will kick off that five-part series on Wednesday, January 11th. Please watch your email and our website for details. During tonight's presentation, please remember to place your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. It's my pleasure to introduce Neil Dibble. Neil received his degree in environmental sciences from the University of Wisconsin Green Bay in 1978. During the summer of 1977, he attended the University of Michigan Biological Station in Pelston, Michigan. He a place he calls boot camp for biologists. In 1982, Neil began his involvement with prairie nursery, producing native plants and seeds and designing native landscapes. He has since devoted his efforts to advocating the use of prairie plants as well as native trees, shrubs, and wetland plants in contemporary American landscapes. It's important to note that Neil was promoting native plants long before it was, quote, cool. Please join me in welcoming Neil to learn more about meaningful maintenance. Thank you, Renee. It's great to be with you all tonight. And we're gonna talk about a continuing trend in America and in the world actually, where human beings are on an increasing basis reintegrating with nature. And we have divorced ourselves from, with, from nature for the last few centuries. And thankfully we are gradually and increasingly realizing that we are truly a part of nature. And when we come to that conclusion, we no longer have a need to dominate, but rather more of a drive to cooperate. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight is how do we cooperate with nature in order to foster biodiversity in our gardens, in our meadows, in our savannas, our landscapes in general. But what this requires is a complete reorientation of the way we approach the environment the way we approach our surroundings, the way we approach our world. So it's incumbent upon us if we are going to survive as a species to realize we can't keep knocking down all the pillars of the organisms that support us as well as other life. We have to rebuild those edifices, those structures that support life, that support us. And everybody knows pollinators are essential. One third of the foods that we eat require pollinators. So the more we can do to promote pollinators, the better it is not just for the pollinators, it's also good for us. So if there's a, some, a significant self-interest here. So tonight we're gonna look at meaningful maintenance <clears throat> while cleanup with positive impact. Now, first and foremost, I wanna let you all know, I'm a prairie guy, okay? I've been doing this 45 years. As Renee said, I was prairie before prairie was cool. And um, when I went into business 40 years ago, it's like, well, I didn't go into business to make money and I've been very successful in that regard. So it's been, <laughs> I was a little ahead of the curve. Obviously things have changed in the last 40 years as people have come to realize, hey, native plants really make a lot of sense. I couldn't give this stuff away 40 years ago. Literally couldn't give it away. They're all weeds. Every single plant I grow was a weed. And they call this the weed farm in rural Wisconsin. It was a joke, but there was some uh, sincerity in the farmers locally when they would say that. 
but it was still basically a joke. But they couldn't understand how we could sell quote unquote weeds. Of course, most of these plants are relatively conservative. They don't exhibit weedy behavior. Most are very good uh, members of their communities, their plant communities and their wildlife communities. So, and of course, I know people that are watching like know that, but this really requires um, a complete realignment of our value system and the way we see ourselves within our landscapes. And I'm hoping that this trend continues and so that we can actually as a society become more respectful of all the other organisms with which we share this planet, which will lead to our own self-preservation as well as theirs. But I'm not a wildlife ecologist. I'm not an insect specialist. I'm gonna share with you my uh, experience over the last 45 years of working with prairies. And I know some um, general concepts, but when you get into specific species, it's, that's not my strong point. But when we talk about prairie management, which I'm hoping we'll have some time for, I'd be more than happy to address some issues with that as well. Again, with an eye towards meaningful maintenance and what we can do to promote biodiversity in our, in our gardens and uh, in our landscapes. So <clears throat> I knew when, I knew my prairie was a success when I saw a meadow jumping mouse. I don't know how many people have seen a meadow jumping mouse. Uh, Zappus had on it. it is the most incredible mouse. And its tail is four to five times as long as its body and it can jump four or five feet high. And it also, stays outside, it does not come in your house. So it is an outdoor mouse. So it does not cause issues in your living environment. So that seems kind of strange that you, someone would think that their landscape was a success when they had a mouse. But the mouse was indicative that I had the correct habitat. I had the proper grassland habitat to support this amazing creature. And I also felt that it was successful when I saw a hognose snake. And a hognose snake is one of the most amazing snakes and it, it does mimicry, I mean, it just it plays dead. And you can pick up the snake and it looks like a cobra and it's just the greatest thing when you're a kid to play with hognose snakes. And so when I had a hognose snake in my prairie, I felt, yes, this is really, really doing something. It's not about just the plants, it's about the entire community that I was now supporting all these other organisms. And people say, well, I don't want mice and voles and moles in my prairie. Well, I say to those people, do you like hawks? you like owls? Most people will say, of course, we love charismatic macrofauna. So yes, we love hawks and owls. Well, what do hawks and owls eat? They eat rodents, snakes, sometimes small birds. But if you don't have that complete ecosystem, you're not going to get those wonderful visitors like hawks, owls, and all the raptors. So, Neil, Neil, I don't want to interrupt you, but did you want yeah. to share your screen or are you going to share your screen later? I'm gonna get to the screen later. Okay, okay. perfect, thank so you. I'm sorry little, for interrupting you. Okay. This is just kind of a little introduction, okay? I get it, so, got it, got it, thank so you. So this is just kind of the, the philosophical part here, okay? So I think this is important that, that we share this concept with our friends, our neighbors, et cetera. And for all these years, the people that have these messy native gardens have been the outcasts. They've been the pariahs in their neighborhoods. But I've been saying for 40 years, some, someday those people that hire these people in moon suits to come and spray toxic chemicals on their lawns will be the prize when we come to realize that that's really the problem and that biodiverse native habitats are really the valuable landscapes that we should be promoting. So, but to get to the point of maintenance, in general, when it comes to fall maintenance, lazy is best. If you wanna promote wildlife, and you want to maintain good populations of invertebrates, pollinators, butterflies, moths, etc. Don't clean everything up. Let it lay there. So yes, I know it's nice to get a jump on garden maintenance for spring, because in spring you have so many other projects. But again, if you really want to do the best you can for biodiversity in your landscape, in almost every case, you're better off just to leave the debris and remove it in spring, either by cutting, mowing, or burning. So we'll see some examples of that. So don't do a thing, wait till spring. So let's get into the show here now. Um, slideshow, please. Oh, gosh. At the top there, go to slideshow. I know, I'm trying to, okay, there okay, we go. There you go, there you go, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, uh, no many, worries. <laughs> okay, how many times have I done this? Uh, okay, there we go, okay. Looks great. So this is my house in the fall. This is what it looks like right about now. 
So you can see in the foreground, you have little blue stem. And we're going to use common names, not scientific names tonight. But little blue stem, and behind that is Indian grass, which is a wonderful combination with the red and the gold in the fall. And so why in the world would I want to cut this down or remove it? This is, looks good all winter long. And of course, it's a refugia for all sorts of positive wildlife. So let's talk about clean. What is clean? Well, you know, human beings are obsessed with clean and there's good reasons for that. I mean, you don't want, you don't want to have disease that's spreading because you didn't clean things up and piles of stuff harbor all kinds of nasties in living areas and obstructions can lead to falls and injuries. And hey, do you want to visit a hoarder with uh, walking through their corridors of crap? I don't think so. And hey, dirty stuff stinks for good reason. So, and my mom would say, clean up after yourself, wash your hands and take a shower, buddy. So it's ingrained into us and for good reason. For our own personal hygiene, of course, we want to be clean. But nature lives by a different standard. And I would like to say debris is diversity and the staff of life for so many organisms. And the decomposing plant material that forms a winter home and protective area for so many insects, pollinators, and other invertebrates. And what's really interesting is uh, different invertebrates, butterflies, moths, et cetera, overwinter as eggs, larvae, pupae, and adults in duff, leaf, inside stems, outside stems, on trees, shrubs, et cetera. So there's all sorts of different strategies that these critters use for overwintering. Another thing is that if you have just recently planted some new seedlings from seed in an early meadow establishment, leave all that debris because the leaf mulch and the debris help to protect young seedlings from damage over winter, not only just by cover and a little bit of insulation, but also because in the case of grasses and, and forbs, the, uh, the stems will, will uh, grab snow, will trap snow, providing an insulating blanket in young plantings. So and, off, and as you look at a prairie, it's a plant community and you're gonna have recruitment of new species, new seedlings every year. And so those young seedlings will benefit from that debris remaining there. So again, to protect them, insulate them and trap snow. So it's not just uh, the aspect of insects and invertebrates, but also regeneration of a prairie meadow. So who, who lives in that litter? Oh, well, it's amazing. Obviously butterflies and moths and, and the various life stages that we talked about and mated queen bumblebees that just burrow a couple inches underground. And those leaves that are on top of them provide really, that, that they burrow under are really important for insulation to protect them over the winter. And then you've got all these other little guys, centipedes, millipedes, snails, arthropods in general. And what do they do? Well, they feed the little birds, chipmunks, turtles, salamanders, and other reptiles and amphibians. So that whole food web is living in your landscape. And if you remove their homes by taking away the leaves or cutting down the grass and bailing it up, putting it in a compost pile, putting it on a curb in a plastic bag, God forbid, you're taking away their homes and impoverishing your landscape. And of course, then you have all sorts of other critters, uh, other insects, spiders, mites, et cetera, all of which play an important role. You know, when I started doing this years ago, people were afraid of bees. They thought, oh my God, we're gonna get stung by bees. Well, now people want bees. And most people are you know, afraid of spiders, mites, et cetera. Uh, most mites don't bother people, but they bother their other critters. But spiders are cool. I like spiders. I don't wanna you know, make them sound romantic. But they also have a job to do. And there are hundreds and hundreds of different spiders and they're incredibly cool. But I think another area that is finally being understood and appreciated are parasitic wasps. Now we're not talking about parasitic wasps tonight in particular, but there's a parasitic wasp that attacks just about every insect, every arachnid, every small, uh, every small uh, insect related uh, species and keep them in control. So these parasitic wasps, which can lay their eggs on adults, on larva, on pupa, on eggs, to parasitize all these other species, they keep everybody in control. It's not the, our topic tonight, but people think of wasps and they think, oh, no, I don't like wasps. But parasitic wasps are extremely small. They never sting people because they're not after people. And when people think of wasps, they think of yellow jackets, mud daubers, et cetera. And all the other, all the wasps that I know of, Hornets, mud daubers, um, ground nesting, cicada killers, you don't bother them, they don't bother you. The only exception, 
is that good old German yellow jacket. It just some stinging those look at you. And that's the one that's on the Coke can when you take a, a drink out of the Coke can and it stings you inside your mouth. Ever had that happen? Oh yeah, that's fun. But parasitic wasps are a completely different class and they are absolutely critical to maintaining the balance of nature. So this is the next front for a lot of people is accepting and understanding and promoting wasps in their gardens. So bees, hey, bees are welcome. Bumblebees, people used to not want bumblebees. Now everybody wants bumblebees because bumblebees are in serious, serious decline. So let's get the wasp in on this love affair too. So well, let's just look at butterflies because butterflies are sexy. So how do butterflies overwinter? They overwinter some as adults, like we talked about, eggs, larva, pupae, adults. Ones that overwinter as adults include the morning cloak. And I've listed the larval host plants here because that's where you might find them. Okay. And the question mark, the hackberry, elm, house, very similar to the morning cloak. And Milbert's tortoise shell, again, they prefer nettles. And you think about, well, who wants nettles in their garden? Well, if you want Milbert's tortoise shell and you want red admirals, red admiral also, I believe, is also a nettle lover. So you want to have these plants that may not be particularly exciting from the standpoint of, oh, I've got nettles in my garden. Isn't that great? And I get stung when I touch them. But if you want to attract some of these butterflies, they're really important to have there. And it's really interesting. Uh, these butterflies that overwinter as adults produce a glycogen substance in their blood, which acts as antifreeze, so they don't freeze up. So it's a pretty amazing adaptation and pretty incredible that these butterflies are able to overwinter as adults. We're going to see a few pictures here because you got to have the sexy pictures. Got the morning cloak, which is when your very first butterflies to emerge in spring because it's already an adult. And oftentimes it will be found in crevices like in tree bark or in rocks, but sometimes in the grass as well, but most commonly in tree bark, but you're not gonna be removing tree bark in your fall cleanup, but just an interesting point. Sometimes they are also in leaves on the ground. And of course the question mark, another beautiful butterfly. And the Eastern comma, a close relative. And that gorgeous Milbert's tortoise shell. And of course, you can't have enough pictures of Milbert's tortoise shell. Just wonderful. So these are these interesting butterflies that overwinter as adults. Quite an incredible adaptation. And the red admiral. The ubiquitous red admiral, which sometimes has tremendous, what we call eruptions, where you have these huge populations that appear in the summer if they have really good years. We had a big eruption of red admirals about two or three years ago here. Just flocks of them. It was incredible. So some butterflies overwinter as caterpillars. <clears throat> some in plant stems, some at the base of host plants, mostly in the duff or inside, inside a protective layer inside a stem. So the great spangled fritillary, meadow fritillary, uh, which depend upon violets as their larval host plants, the caterpillars will overwinter in leaves on the ground, usually near the, their host plants, near a population of violets, and they come up early in spring. They emerge early in spring from them. From the grant, from the uh, duff, and then begin feeding on the violet leaves. And the violet is an early season plant, so it has leaves, oftentimes has some evergreen leaves, so it's ready to go when those fritillaries are waking up in spring. So there's a ready food source right there in the violet plants nearby them. And the eastern tail blue, this is this is fascinating. I did not know this until I started doing this, this little presentation, that the caterpillars overwinter in seed pods, primarily in legumes. Who knew? But that's pretty incredible. And the Baltimore checker spot, which is an oligolectic species, meaning that it has only one food source for its larva or one genus, the genus Chelone or Turtlehead. And the caterpillars will overwinter in leaf litter on the ground, usually near the plants, ready to go for it so they can start feeding on the plants when they emerge in spring. So of course, we got to see the wonderful great spangled fritillary. Very commonly found on many of your prairie plants. It's a very, very important, or very uh, ubiquitous prairie species. And here it is on common milkweed, but it likes to, to feed as adult on many of your prairie flowers, as do most butterflies. Eastern tailed blue, a oh, gorgeous, gorgeous butterfly. And the Baltimore checker spot, which relies upon the turtle head exclusively for its larval food source. What an incredibly beautiful butterfly. And it's, you know, it's interesting if you have these choke points for some of these species when you lose wetland habitat where at least the white turtle head grows in the Midwest, you lose those wetland habitats, you lose the white turtle head, you lose the white turtle head, you lose the Baltimore checker spot. 
So it seems like it's not a really good idea to be a specialist. A lot of insects are generalists as far as their larval food sources. But why do plants specialize? Why do, why do certain insects specialize on certain plants? Well, because plants produce toxins to ward off caterpillars eating their leaves. So different species, and the monarch butterfly is a perfect example, have evolved to be resistant to the toxins, in the case of the monarch, of the uh, toxic sap in milkweed plants. Baltimore checker spot has found a way to be able to, to consume the leaves of the genus Chelone for the turtle head. And that is, again, its specific host. So this, plant, this, this is a very important consideration when we lose habitat, we lose not just the plants, but we lose the, the fascinating creatures that depend upon them. Some butterflies overwinter as eggs, which seems like a, another pretty dubious strategy, but it seems to work. Here in central Wisconsin, we are the, uh, the big refugia, the world's most only real significant populations of carnivore blue butterflies. Because the carnivore blue butterfly host plant is our wild lupine, Lupinus perennis, which grows in dry sand prairies. And we have plenty of sand here in the central plains, central outwashed plains, a big glacial dump of sand. And lupine grows abundantly in that, or at least significant enough populations to support carnivore blue populations. And we have customers who plant mixes, prairie mixes with lots of lupine in them, along with many, many of their nectar plants, which grow in the prairies to create habitat for carnivore blue. So a lot of people are very much focused on this and they will plant a mix containing these species. I had one customer who was required to plant a prairie mix by our Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for a restoration project. And he said, I want that dry prairie mix, but take out all the lupine because I don't want any carnivore blue because then they'll make me protect it and they won't let me do anything with my land. <laughs> so I think he was a little bit paranoid, but many people are really well, trying to restore the habitat for this federally endangered butterfly, the carnivore blue, which relies completely on wild lupine. And the purplish copper, uh, interestingly, host plants in the buckwheat family primarily, as well as cinquefoils. Um, and these eggs are laid at the base of the host plants, unlike the carnivore blue that, le that lays their eggs on the leaves. And the coral hair streak, one of my favorite butterflies, uh, actually the larva feeds on fruits and flowers, uh, roses, cherry, wild plum, etc. And so these will be on trees as well as shrubs in your prairie. So if you have wild roses, you might have coral hair streak on those. And so that's where that would be applicable in your fall cleanup because many of your roses, of course, are sh obviously shrubs. And in the, in the prairie ecosystem. So you, you would want to keep, let those stand over the winter so you can preserve those eggs. If you cut them down and remove them, the chance of those butterflies not only being able to survive as eggs, but then they would not have their host plant because they were specifically laid on that host plant, which you have removed. Okay. And like aphids, ants tend the larvae of the coral hair streak. And so they also produce the, the larvae also produce honeydew, which is what the ants then consume because it's just a sugary, sweet substance and it has a high nutritional value. And so they will sometimes actually move the larva up and down the plant and move them down at night into the grass for protection so they won't be subject to predation. So very similar to what they do with, um, <clears throat> uh, with aphids on other plants. Then the banded hair streak, this is not really applicable to your fall cleanup in a meadow or a garden. Um, they are laid as eggs on oak and hickory twigs, but of course they're above the ground. So you probably will not be cutting those down for the winter. Here's the beautiful Carner blue, similar in appearance to the Eastern tail blue, but no tail. Increasingly rare, there used to be populations in Michigan, Ohio, Western New York. I think there are still some in, in some of these areas. I think New York is pretty much extricated now, but we have at least decent populations in central Wisconsin. The purplish copper, And the coral hair streak. And interestingly, um, there's no skippers here. Uh, skippers are, are a group similar in size to the hair streak, small, small, fast moving butterflies. They are among the few that will actually, the larvae actually feed on grass. So most butterfly larvae feed on flowers, but the skippers typically feed on various species of grass. But they are not on tonight's discussion because of their reproductive strategy. So some butterflies and moths overwinter as pupae. And many people know about a luna moth where you have these little brown 
elongated little uh, pupae that lay on the ground under the leaves. So these are tree feeding moths for the larva, hickory, birch, uh, sweet gum, persimmon. But then the larva actually drop to the ground and create a pupa in the leaf litter. So this is, this is my favorite moth. You've got all the other uh, sexy moths like the Cecropia, et cetera, Polyphemus. Um, but the Luna moth to me is the most beautiful of all, of all our native moths, just personally. And then the black swallowtail butterfly, which depends upon umbilifers. So you have in the prairie, you've got um, zizias and golden alexanders. It also will feed on, uh, well, I was, <laughs> I was making dilly beans this summer and fall. And unfortunately, um, I lost a few small caterpillars when I collected the dill and put it into my Court, my pint jars when I was canning them and little butterfly larva bit the dust. I felt really bad. So I killed a few by putting dill in my dilly beans. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so these pupa attach themselves to the lower plant stems, sometimes in the ground in the leaf litter, but oftentimes actually attach themselves to the stems a couple feet above the ground. So again, they're susceptible to removal with fall cleanup. And there's a the beautiful luna moth. That's the most incredible creature. My goodness. We're fortunate to have these. We have lots of hickories and cherries where I live. And so it's very uncommon for us not to see Luna moth in any given year. So of course you have to go out at night in order to see them, but that's just incredibly beautiful moth. Then the black swallowtail, the male, it tends to have more blue and purple or bluish on a purple coneflower. And then the black swallowtail female, which has more yellow. So managing a native garden for winter life. So as a lot of people say, leave the leaves, be lazy. If you have to rake your leaves, don't shred them because this can grind up the overwintering butterfly moths and other desirable invertebrates depending on what stage they're in, especially pupae or adults. So that's the end of those. And if you can wait until spring to cut back the garden and wait until mid spring if you can, okay? rather than fall, because this allows you to retain the stems for overwintering insects as well as the leaf litter. Okay, And why mid-spring? Because the later you can go in spring, the more opportunity there is for these overwintering creatures to emerge and begin their new life cycles. So the later, in most cases, the better. Now, this is where we get into some management conundrums, because especially if we're burning, we can do damage to some of the early emerging flowers, and we'll talk about that in a little while. So it's this never-ending dance or balance between what methodology is going to achieve the desired goals. If you have to manage against invasive exotics, burning usually in mid-spring or mowing in mid-spring is usually excellent timing. And most of your invertebrates are have emerged by that time. So it's a pretty good compromise. So there might be some situations where certain insects have not yet emerged, but if you're doing your, your spring maintenance in mid-spring, which for you would be probably mid-April to, and here we're a little bit north of you, we can uh, go, go all the way into early May sometimes. And if you cut back plants in the fall, if you have to, by mowing high, a foot or 12 to 15 inches, you can leave those stems where a lot of insects will overwinter, you leave those stems as their winter homes. <clears throat> so sometimes maybe you have a need that you actually feel that you have to cut everything down, at least leave a 12, 12 15, 18 inch stems for those winter homes. And of course, leave the seed heads in the berry standing. Um, some native flowers, um, grasses and shrubs retain their seed heads well into winter and can be really important food sources for seed eating birds. And we don't often think of this. We think of like uh, viburnum. Some of the viburnums uh, will hold their seeds on, on their shrubs quite late, but we don't think of a lot of our prairie species as doing that, but there are some that do and serve as really important food sources and emergency food sources when times are tough in the middle of winter. Also, something else that is not considered is that the standing stems that remain in spring because you didn't cut them in, down in fall serve as singing perches for male songbirds during spring breeding. So that's a really important aspect of this, not just about food, not just about water, and not just about habitat, it's also about sex. Well, surprise, surprise. So some examples, and we're gonna see this in more than one case, the roses, viburnums, echinaceas, monardas, some of the legumes, joe pieweeds actually will hold their seeds into late fall and sometimes even into winter. And then, some of the bees, a lot of our native bees will overwinter in those plant stems that we're leaving 
or maybe only cut back to 12 or 15 inches. So you've got leaf cutter bees, mason bees, yellow face bees, small carpenter bees, and they like the hollow stems of some of the same guys, Joe Pyweed, the Echinaceas, Monardus, cup plant. Cup plant to all around wildlife plant that also can be a garden thug, but my goodness, cup plant is incredible because it attracts birds like crazy, it attracts insects to the water in the cups. The birds eat the insects, the birds eat the seeds, but then the seeds get scattered all over your yard and then you have a yard full of cup plants. So it's uh, on its report card, it says for cup plant, it does not play well with others. So it's, it's a bit of a thug. This is one of your invasive native plants. But if you want wildlife habitat, my goodness, it's really hard to beat cup plant. And if you live in Northeastern Ohio with those heavy clay soils, cup plant loves clay, eats it up. Okay. And of course the roses, well, blackberries and raspberries and other pithy stemmed plants are really good for overwintering for these bees and some other species as well, not just bees. So the fall garden and the winter garden to me is an important part of the whole annual cycle. I have four seasons of interest in my garden because I don't cut anything down in the fall. I leave a stand all winter and I do my maintenance in the spring and I get all the benefits of this case, prairie drop seed, which is one of our most, arguably our most ornamental native grass. You could argue a little blue stem is, is as good. But prairie drop seed has these wonderful mounds of green in the summer, and I'm not showing that because I'm showing it in the fall. And then offset here against asters and, and seed. I'll tell you, asters and seed and goldenrods and seed, I think are some absolutely beautiful aspects of the garden. And even after the seeds have been uh, flown away, once they have left, you have these receptacles, especially on things like stiff goldenrod that are absolutely beautiful structurally. If you look at your stiff goldenrod after the seeds have blown away, look at those carefully, they're incredible. And the coneflowers, pale purple coneflower, those seeds will hang on there well into the fall. And here you have an automatic bird feeder. Birds go crazy on this. And again, by leaving these stems, this is a very commonly used singing perch for songbirds. Pale purple coneflower in particular, purple coneflower as well. But pale purple coneflower has stronger stems, holds up better, and it's a little bit taller, which gives the birds an advantage of being four or five feet above ground rather than just a three feet above ground. So they're a little more protected from predators on the ground and they're more visible to potential mates. So pale purple coneflower is a great remaining stem for spring songbirds for mating season. Here's another picture of the purple coneflower, pale purple coneflower seed head with the seeds in it have, have not been quite eaten by birds yet. And then prairie drop seed. The prairie drop seed has a small little seed that has, is very nutritious. In fact, Native Americans used to collect it and grind it up to make flour. So if you've ever collected prairie drop seed by hand, you know that this is a very, very near, a very dear pancake that you're making out of that prairie drop seed because it's a lot of work to collect that prairie drop seed. But it was used uh, for grinding into flour by Native peoples on the prairies. And of course, mature ironweed seeds, I mean, it's just, brilliant. It really does. It lights up the garden. So the garden in the fall to me is not quite as showy as the, as, as the color of the flowers, but it's a close second. And a lot of these seeds, if you spend any amount of time looking at them, they're just stunning. And the structure and the architecture is, is pretty incredible. And the so lead plant retains its seeds into late fall, early winter. And this is another important food for birds. It has a very nutritious little seed in there. It's a legume. Legume seeds are very sought after, sought after after birds. Unfortunately, this plant does not grow in clay and needs a well-draining sand, sandy loam soil. So if you have a heavy clay, I wouldn't recommend this. If it's well-drained clay, you might be able to get, get it to grow, but it really does need good drainage. But really wonderful plant with purple and orange flowers in the summer, and then retains these seeds well into the early winter. And perhaps the most an important emergency food is a plant called roundhead bush clover, which also requires a, a well-drained soil, particularly sandy soil. These can actually, these plants can retain their seeds all the way into January. And I remember one year, uh, in the early years, when most we mostly collected seed in the wild, uh, we went out one January and collected seed of this. And I would say about one third of the seeds remained inside of those seed heads. So it was worth our while to go out and collect that seed even in January. So you know that birds were utilizing this as well as a winter emergency food. And you can see them on this, pecking the seeds out in the dead of winter when there's a foot or two of snow on the ground and foraging on the ground is very difficult. But these upright stems with these seeds in them are easy mark for them in order to get a good meal when times are tough. 
And Donnie Woodpecker here looking for grubs and goldenrod. Of course, these goldenrod stems, along with other stems, pithy stems, are homes for grubs. And somehow these different woodpeckers know how to find them. I don't know how they do it, but I can tell you I had a pileated woodpecker that knew there were grubs in my hickory tree. And that thing demolished that tree in a matter of a few days and dug two thirds of the way into it and killed my hickory tree. It was a, about a 16 inch diameter hickory tree and he just shredded it. So they somehow know where those bugs are and they can find them. And so the golden rods and other plants also are great homes for grubs, which then become foods for your, for your woodpeckers. And bergamot, has anybody looked at the structure of bergamot seed heads? Was, this was one of my first loves when I was a teenager. I was just looking at these heads. I didn't, I didn't even know the name of the plant. It was just growing wild. And I looked at that and I said, my goodness, that's just incredibly beautiful. So if you look at the seed heads, and right now is the perfect time to look at it, the seed heads of bergamot are absolutely gorgeous and they're quite deep. And so there are seeds that will be retained in the lower reaches of bergamot that also can serve as a winter emergency food for small songbirds. And Rudbeckia. Rudbeckia is great all year long. And so you have those beautiful jet black seed heads, which are trying to turn brown later in the season. And then you top them off with a little meringue or a little snow meringue on top of them on a wintry day. And you've got an absolutely gorgeous landscape. And you've got a little bit of sumac there in the background with its beautiful little spiky little seed heads. So what's not to like? The fall landscape, the winter landscape of a prairie garden or a prairie meadow is just stunning to me. And this is something really interesting that I saw a couple of winters ago. This was in late February. And of course, the wild turkeys marched through our yard all year long. And this turkey came up to a tall Joe pie weed plant that had seed heads remaining on it from the, from the year, early, pre previous year. And they're 10 feet tall. And the turkey went in there and severed the, the stem. And this is a hollow pithy stem where you can also find insects, but it didn't go for the insects. It severed the stem. So the stem came down on the ground and then it went and cut off the seed head and started eating seeds that were remaining on that tall Joe pie weed inflorescence. So I was stunned. I'm sitting here watching this out the window like, oh my God, that's incredible. Never saw that before. So that was just an interesting learning experience to see the wild turkeys finding seeds. And they knew that there were seeds up there. So by severing that lower stem, he was unable to get to the seeds on the seed stalk. And here's my prairie you know, uh, winter some time ago when we had a late season ice storm. And I got a whole new view of little blue stem. Little blue stem is quite upright. And it's also very important in the winter landscape because it has very high standability. So if you're looking at grasses that will provide you with winter interest, forget about big blue stem. It's going to fall down right away, even without ice or snow. And prairie drop seed is a little bit short. And the seed heads tend to drop off, fall down. If you get into the snow season, in the fall, they're beautiful. But as you get into winter, they pretty much get covered up. Indian grass is next to drop, but little blue stem and switchgrass, Panicum brigatum and Schizocerium scoparium, are the two, have the two highest standability factors of your prairie grass. So they have those, the strongest stems that will stand up and look good all winter long. And then you get an ice storm and you get a whole nother perspective on that. And then after the ice melts, then they spring back up right into their upright position. So you say, well, if I don't clean all this stuff up in the fall, what about plant diseases? I thought we were supposed to clean everything up so we didn't have all these remnant material. And that is true. But if you look at most fungal and viral diseases, that can be a problem. Yep, you need good hygiene. But powdery mildew and downy mildew, black spot, which are our most common fungal diseases generally on native plants, these can be removed during the growing season and should be removed in the growing season if you have an infestation. That's when you can really control them because you do not want those leaves falling on the ground where they can continue that cycle. So if you can remove them during the growing season, as soon as you see them to prevent spread, then you do not have them becoming a, a factor in your garden the next year. So if you let them drop, then of course, yes, not cleaning up in the fall could be problematic because now you have those vectors there. So you wanna do that due diligence during the growing season if possible. And of course, aster yellows, which is a terrible, terrible malady, a viral disease transmitted by the aster leafhopper. And you don't just remove the leaves, you got to dig the whole darn plant up as, as a recommended treatment. So if you have that, and hopefully you don't, you need to get those out right away during the growing season. 
So, so usually you will have control of fungal diseases and viral maladies in the summer and early fall before you get to your fall cleanup. So now let's look at managing prairie meadows for faunal diversity. Okay, we're going out of the garden now where we're usually cutting. We're going into prairie meadows where we're usually going to use burning or mowing. Okay, and the most effective tool we have for managing prairie meadows to keep out invasive exotic plants and native invasive plants is controlled burning. Now this does not prevent inv all invasives, either native nor non or non native, from being a problem, but it is able, really good at controlling cool season weeds, cool season grasses, and most invasive woody plants. Okay, but the problem is when we burn, we destroy overwintering invertebrates and, and other life forms. So how do we get around this? Well, whenever possible, you want to avoid burning in fall and early spring. Again, it's just like not cutting back until mid spring because you want to allow the organisms to emerge from the duff, from the stems, etc., in mid-spring. So hopefully they'll all be out by the time you're actually burning or mowing in that latter, latter part of spring. So if you can burn as late as possible, that really makes a, a difference. Also, it's good timing because most of your cool season weeds and grasses and a lot of your woody plants are best controlled with a mid-spring burn. Now, when I say a mid-spring burn, what is mid-spring? Well, what I have found is that if you have problems with cool season grasses, in your prairie meadow, which includes things like bluegrass, smooth brown grass, tall fescue, quack grass, and then clovers like white clover, red clover, and other cool season non-native species. If you can wait until those emerge and start greening up, and generally those grasses are gonna be four to five inches tall. If you burn, or if you can't burn, you can mow right down close to the ground, okay, to mimic the effects of burning mow and then rake everything off to expose the soil to the warming rays of the sun. If you can wait until the buds of the sugar maple tree are opening, and I can't give you a date, but I can give you a, tr a tree because the plants never lie. They're all tuned in with each other. And one year, the plants will, you'll be ready to burn on April 10th and the next year it'll be May 10th. So you never know, depending on the spring. So you go to Chardon and look at the sugar maples and make sure that when those buds are just breaking open, you know that it's time for you to burn or to mow. Now, you don't want to do this every year. Frequency is, is really important. We'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. But if you can let go a little bit later, that gives time for your vertebrates to emerge. And it also allows the invasive cool season weeds, grasses, and woody plants. If you can get the woody plants to start to green up, when you burn, you're going to do proportionally more damage to them because you are burning back their new growth. They have expended their root reserve, or at least some portion of their root reserve, to make that new growth. So they made a withdrawal on their bank account. And now they have less money or less energy. Than what they started with and after you burn the soil turns black which then absorbs the heat of the sun and moves into the temperature range that is more favorable to the primarily warm season heat loving prairie flowers and grasses so it really can make a huge difference as far as the performance of your prairie just with a single burn usually in your area mid to late april so it's really really important again if you can't burn you mow right down to the dirt as close as you can and rake off the material to expose the soil to the warming rays of the sun, and that's approximately 50% as effective. Again, we'll see this in, in a minute. Okay, so wait until mid spring, if at all possible, for a variety of reasons, if you have a prairie meadow that you're going to burn or mow. Okay. Rotational burning and mowing saves lives. What is rotational mowing? What is rotational burning? Divide your prairie meadow into, a, into at least two separate management units. And mowed graph paths work really well. It's nice to have six, eight, 10 feet wide. If you have really tall grass, you might want to make it 12 or 15 wide. And another trick is if you have heavy fuel in the form of grass, especially tall gray grasses, before you burn, mow it down like the, that morning when it's dry, well, when it's dry weather, okay, in the spring. Don't mow it down in the fall because it'll all mat down and it'll get all soggy and it won't burn well. So you want to mow it like the day before or the day you're going to burn. Mow it down so you don't have six foot tall grass standing up or eight or, eight or six or four. Mow it down so it's only a foot off the ground, and then the, the prairie flames will be much lower and much easier to control. So if you have a mowed grass path, it won't jump that mowed grass. Okay, so that's really important. So then you have these different management units, and you will burn or mow each unit rotationally every two or three years. Okay, and you leave at least one unit unburned or unmowed annually because that's your refugia for your various organisms. So there's no mow no mowing, no burning, no disturbance whatsoever at all in the spring. So everybody gets to overwinter and come up in the spring. As I mentioned earlier, if you can't burn, 
Mowing and raking out the cut material to expose the soil, again, this is in mid-spring, is about 50% as effective as burning for controlling cool season weeds and grasses. And I did some studies on this many years ago where we actually collected biomass, took uh, samples of um, <clears throat> frequency of species and the effect on controlling cool season grasses and came out with about a 50 to 60% a relationship between mowing and raking versus burning. Burning is better. Burning also is more effective at controlling woody invaders because when you mow you do not burn down to the soil level and when you burn down to the soil level you can really hammer those stems of young seedlings of buckthorn or honeysuckle or um, autumn olive and all those nasties that want to invade your prairie so the, when you burn and you want to burn when the soil is not wet because that'll allow it to burn right down to the soil right down to the uh, lowest point possible to remove as much of the vegetation of the target species that you're removing and does significantly more damage to the woody vegetation. Now, uh, we'll talk about head fires and backfires in a moment, but again, waiting until you can do this as late as possible, make sure you divide your prairie into uh, two or three different units and leave at least one unburned or unmowing. And burning every other year, every two years, provides really good control of woody plants. And if you go three years, it's very interesting in my experience, if you go three years, those woody plants have now developed sufficient root systems that they are not killed by the fire. A one-year seedling or a two-year-old seedling is almost always killed by the fire of a woody plant. But by the time it's three years old, it has sufficient energy stored in that root that it will not be killed and it will re-sprout. And now fire is no longer a utilitarian tool for controlling those woody invasives. So I burn my prairies whenever possible every other year. And that also maintains a good balance of flowers to grasses. And if you burn every year in mid-spring, you're going to push the equilibrium of that prairie more towards the warm season grasses, and you're gonna push it away from the flowers, which is not what most people want from a standpoint of aesthetics, color, and pollinator services, because grasses provide essentially no pollinator services. You want flowers for pollinators. So you don't wanna burn every year, especially in mid-spring, because you will find yourself with way more grass than you want. But I found that burning every other year, usually late April, gives me a really good balance between the flowers and grasses over decades. There's an example of a mode path. This is about a six, seven foot mode path. This serves as a fire break for this client's two prairies. They burn, it's, it's, it just winds through a long narrow prairie. They burn one half every year, leaving one half unburned and then they rotate and burn the unburned one the next year and leave the, the one that was burned the previous year unburned again for refugia for wildfire. So here's my house. So I have this uh, remnant oak savanna and I've enhanced it. So I'm burning this in mid spring. This is mid April. I believe this, I think this was April 19th. A little bit of an early spring forest. Not a lot is greened up. Uh, this is mostly native vegetation that's going to come up later. I have a little path. If you look on the right, there's a little grass path that I planted that serves as my fire break. Because I have very low fuel here, I don't need a big wide fire break. I only have about a three foot wide path that serves. I've never lost anything, never jumped it. Okay, and you'll notice that I am working against the wind. Okay, see how the flames are going backwards at the ground level? The wind is coming from the left and the fire is coming from the right. And so it's, although it's moving uphill and when you're going uphill, that preheats the vegetation and you can get, and we'll see in a minute what happens when you, uh, when the wind changes. Okay, but right now the wind in this case is coming out of the north. The fire started on the south and moving gradually up the hill against the wind. This is a backfire. This is the safest way to do this. And assuming that all your organisms have, have emerged and, and gone on their merry way to wherever they're going to be, uh, this is also going to do significantly more damage to your cool season weeds, grasses, and woody plants because a backfire is much more effective at controlling that vegetation. And why is that? That's because the effects of fire on vegetation are a combination of intensity and duration. Those are the two factors that determine how much damage is done to green growing or woody stems vegetation. So a head fire goes really fast. And so it does not last long, but a backfire creeps along the ground. So the duration of that exposure to the fire is significantly longer than a fast moving head fire. A head fire being a fire that moves with the wind rapidly. Also the intensity of a slow moving backfire the heat is right at the soil surface. And that's where you're gonna get the deepest penetration to do the most damage to those unwanted, undesirable cool season weeds, grasses, and woody plants. 
Whereas a head fire, all the heat goes up. And so it's going up in the atmosphere and you're not getting hardly any benefit at the ground. And oftentimes you'll see unburned material at the base of a head fire because it moves so fast, it just skips across. But a backfire moves very slowly. And so you have not only the duration, but you also have much higher intensity at the ground level doing significantly more damage to the target vegetation that you're trying to control. So here, now the wind is starting to pick up a little. I'm getting some uh, critical mass. And of course, the fire will create its own wind. And so now I've got it starting all the way out, pretty much all the way around. And you can see it's starting to move up bigger flames, starting to move a little faster. And then on a hillside, kaboom, off she goes. Now the wind kind of moved around and started coming out of the south. But I've got a good break to the north, so I'm not worried. It's not going to get out of control. But this is when it starts to be a little more fun. So, but I'm not getting the same control because now the fire is moving faster. But the soil was pretty dry, so I got good penetration of the heat down to the soil level. And then here we are 26 days later, starting to green up. And it looks pretty springy. My oak savanna, and the flowers and grasses are emerging. And then right around the corner, which was burned over, if you, you can't really see it here, but to the far upper left, uh, the savanna turns into a prairie, and here's what that prairie looks like in early July, early to mid-July. So now my butterfly weed, my pale purple cone flower, my wild quinine, the white flower, uh, really starting to come on. And this is at the, the flor flowering activity is almost always more pronounced and denser when, after a year of a burn compared to a year without a burn. And here's another view. This is one of my favorite combinations where you've got the white and the purple. And a lot of people think of prairies, oh, it's just a bunch of yellow composites. Well, not in May and June and July. The most common flower in the prairie is yellow, but it's usually in the fall, late summer and fall. The second most common flower color is white. So you have tremendous opportunities to combine whites, purples, uh, blues, pinks, really nice uh, chromatic pinks, purples, blues mixed with the white. So you get this almost like this, um, um, what's the word? Um, I can't think of it now. Um, there's a word for this. But anyway, these wonderful co color combinations that are not hot. And of course, butterfly wheat is the only orange flower that occurs in our prairie. Orange is rare. So it rhymes with orange, and there's nothing else out in the prairie that rhymes with orange. So you got butterfly wheat, and that's it. Okay. So this is a really nice combination, and not uncommon for you to see this depending on the seed mix that you do. The word I was looking for is pastel. So this is like a pastel prairie here primarily. Not hot, but very cool. So that's what I've got tonight. Um, I was told it was OK to tell you about a book that I, my co-author and I, Hillary Cox, and I have been working on for 22 years. And it is coming out on March 24th of next year. It's called The Gardener's Guide to Prairie Plants. There's 148 species, I believe. And it describes the plants from every stage of their life cycle, from seedling to seed head, including leaves, flowers, the, the complete plant. Uh, it's really quite comprehensive. So it has mostly flowers. There's a 19, uh, there's 18 grasses in one sedge, and but all the rest are flowers or shrubs, low-growing shrubs like roses, lead plant, New Jersey tea, etc. And there's lots of information, tremendous amount of information in tables where you can reference uh, plant characteristics as well as descriptions of the history of the prairie, the evolution of the prairie ecosystem, and how to some basic concepts of prairie gardening and establishing prairie meadows and maintaining them. So this is coming out March 24th. We'll have this listed on our website. So just want to let everybody know that. And if you, for some reason, would like to contact us, you can contact us uh, on our website or you can give us a call. So that's what I do. That's what I've been doing for 40 years. And so I guess now would be the appropriate time to open this up to questions. I yes. hope this is, is helpful. This is great, Neil. I'll never look at snow on the top of a seed pot again. I'll always think of a lemon meringue pie. Exactly. <laughs> and that, it's just like, yeah, let's go eat those rudbeckias. <laughs> nice little fluffy meringue on top of there. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, as you can imagine, we do have some questions. So I'm going to give those to you now. Um, let me uh, let me do this. Let me back yeah. up so we have a pretty picture to look at. How's that? Oh, and it is beautiful. Those are like so cool, cool looking, you know, yep. like beautiful flowers. Um, my issue um, is waiting until we have 50 
degree days in spring to clean up. By then, a lot of my perennials are coming up, and with the spring rains, I have a slimy mess. Do I just leave it? It is very difficult to remove once the individual plants start to emerge. Yes, that's a really good point. <clears throat> um, see, this, this individual has clay soils in Lake County, something like that probably, right? And it's really <laughs> hard to work. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I don't know, really, but I'm sure. <laughs> I'm guessing, you know, yeah. my, my, my limited knowledge of the region. So uh, that's really, really an issue now. Um, you can, and, and this is the beauty of this is when it finally dries out, you can cut it back, but leave those old stems a foot tall. And assuming that your perennials are going to get two, three, four, or five feet tall, they're going to cover up those old stems. And those old stems are going to start to decompose as well if you don't mind looking at those stems, but if you think of them as an integral part of your habitat, leaving a foot tall stem when you when you wait until it's a little bit farther along, you're only cutting it 12 inches. Now, there may be other debris that you want to get out of there that's also associated with that. So it's really hard to it's really hard to say, oh yeah, I just cut it 12 inches and everything will be beautiful. Because right. you may have other stuff you want to remove. And it becomes obviously much more difficult when the plants are greened up. So there are trade-offs with this. There indeed there are trade-offs. So and every person will have to make the decision that they think is best for their situation. And there may be some cases where you can't necessarily provide all the options for optimizing habitat. Sure. And that's just some that's trade offs of life sometimes. So, but if you're okay yeah. with cutting back to a foot later, later on in spring above the new growth, then you can kind of compromise okay. as long as your perennials are going to be taller and just cover up the last year's debris. That's one possibility. That's good. Um, here's a question from Erie, Pennsylvania. How soon after the leaves fall do the overwintering insects show up? Are they in the leaves before they even fall from the trees? I wish I could mow one last time before winter. Last spring, the grass was too high in mid-May for my battery powered mower. So that's, that's a really interesting, yeah. <laughs> um, your other option there, and I should have mentioned this, instead of mowing, is to rake. Okay. Okay, and people say, well, that's too much work to go out there and rake. But you know what? They have these trail behind, if you have a larger area, and especially lawns under trees, okay? Mm -hmm. And you want to remove those leaves so they don't smother your grass if you have a shaded lawn, okay? Which I'm assuming is the situation here, because normally in the full sun, you wouldn't usually have those leaves, so you must be in a semi-shaded situation. So they make these pull behind leaf rakes that just have these little, um, this little drum that, that rakes the leaves into a container, into a, you know, a pull behind little debris catcher. And then you can spread those on your perennial garden. If you have a perennial garden. This is what, what I commonly do. Um, I live out in the country, but I will go into town, town of about oh, 1800 people. And these nice people, they rake up all their leaves and they put them in plastic bags and put them out right by the road for me to pick up and put in the truck and take home and put on my gardens. They put it in my compost pile. It's incredible. These are the nicest people because they give me their leaves. Okay. And I will go and look, okay, do they have maple trees? Do they, uh, it used to be ash trees. You can't get that anymore because maple, ash, birch, elm. And sometimes you still do have a few elms, okay, depending on the species. So, so these are sweet leaves, basswood. Um, these are really good leaves. They decompose rapidly. But if you want something that lasts longer, oaks and hickories have more tannins in them. And so they will give you more long lasting mulch. And I will put up to 12 inches of leaves, loose leaves, a foot deep on top of my woodland gardens. And all those woodland plants come up through it in the spring. So if you can remove the leaves from the lawn and then deposit them on your woodland garden or perennial garden, uh, any uh, decent stature sized perennial will come up through those leaves because that 12 inches of leaves is going to with snow and rain and winter, that 12 inches are going to reduce down to like four inches. Okay. Okay. So then the perennials just come up right through it. So okay. it's great if you I mean if you have woodland wildflowers, hostas will come right up through it, except the most except for the smallest little hostas. But if you have normal sized hostas, they'll come up right through it. So and that just and then you have no weeds because you're burying all the weeds with those leaves. So that's what I do in my woodland gardens. I just go and get my neighbors abundance of leaves and put them on my garden after I rake mine. And so, is so good. Neil, when you do that, though, do you mulch up those leaves a little bit, or do you just put full size leaves down? I just I just open the bag up and spread them around. Okay. Okay. No, nope. no. Nope. Remember, we talked about 
mulching them, you're, if there's if there's any kind of organisms in there, just raking yeah. them usually won't destroy the eggs or the larvae or whatever. Okay, but if you run them through a mulcher, you're going to potentially shred those critters. So I just throw them right on top of my woodland gardens, and it's great. It's magic. Then I don't have to do any weeding the next year. So the only work, the only work is either raking the leaves or collecting the leaves and then spreading them on the gardens. Yeah. So. Well, you know, you you mentioned a lot about prescribed burns um, during your talk here at the latter end, and I do want to say that every state county area is going to have their own regulations on control burns. So. Um, yep. everyone should really check with that um, before they go out burning. And I will say that in Ohio, um, you do have to have a lot of permits. And we have a we have a burn team in Ohio that sort of works around and um, plans uh -huh. burns on larger natural areas within the state. Um, so but there were some questions about if you need to get a permit to burn. And I can't speak to other states. And Neil is living in the burn capital of the United States. Um, so <laughs> that's all they do in the, in the Midwest is burn their prairies. So, but in Ohio, um, please make sure you um, have permission to burn yes, before you, you burn. You, all, you always need a permit and you want to make sure you follow the rules to the T. Okay. And I've been doing this 45 years. I have never lost a fire and I don't plan on ever losing it. And I don't want to have the authorities coming to my house of all places or my nursery to say, okay, we're here to, we're here to put out your fire that got right. away. <laughs> and for those of you who have never burned uh, or, or have some experience but want more, if you go to our website and I have, I have an article called burn your prairie safely. So I think you can just go in the search and, and okay. enter burn your prairie safely. It should pop up and there's all sorts of important little ideas about designing fire breaks, like I mentioned, mowing mowing on the edges so you don't have big flames or mowing the whole thing before you burn. Mm -hmm. Okay, if it's not too big an area. So there's all sorts of different techniques. And of course, where I live, you can't burn until after 6 p.m. Oh, okay, okay, because after 6 p.m., winds have usually slowed down for the day after the sun starts to drop. Temperatures go down. So that the flammability of material, it's a, it's a function of temperature and the relative humidity goes up. So you have cooler, moister, less windy conditions, so fires tend to stay in control. Where I live, it's okay. sandy soils. We have a lot of oak leaves. Once something gets out of control, it's gone. Okay, so we have very specific timing. You go to southeastern Wisconsin where you have clay soils, and yes, there's oaks, but the soils, the clay soils, hold a lot more moisture than our dry sandy soils. You can burn in the middle of the day. Okay. So they have totally different rules in those counties where they have different soils, and, and in many cases, different, uh, different moisture conditions as far as the fuel load. And, and that's so, that's interesting because one of the questions was actually how does the burn strategy apply to meadows in the northeast that are moister than your midwestern prairie? So it probably has a lot to do with the time of day you're burning and things like that. Well, and here is another issue, okay, and that is uh, fall burning versus spring burning. <clears throat> if you look back in history, in the early accounts of early explorers in the 19th century, early 19th century, late 18th century. Because Native Americans tended to burn prairies in the fall. But it was patchwork burns. They didn't burn everything. And so it would burn in prairies and savannas and it wouldn't burn the whole area. So you'd have all these different areas where you didn't, where you had unburned zones. Okay. So all these insects, pollinators, et cetera, were fine being burned in the fall because everything wasn't burnt. Okay. The problem, as was pointed out by the muddy garden, same thing applies to the muddy prairie meadow is if it's a wet spring, you may not get that prairie burned. And generally speaking, plant debris and soils are drier in the fall. So it's just plain easier to burn in the fall. So again, here's why you divide your prairie into management units. And if you have to burn in the fall, you make sure, on my prairies, I have like four different management units. I burn two each year and leave two rest, okay? So I'm only burning about 50% at any given time. If you leave, if you have to burn in the fall, you leave half of it unburned, then you've got your refugia, hopefully for a sufficient amount of area for your butterflies, moths, pollinators, invertebrates, et cetera. So, I mean, and again, there's trade-offs. There's always trade-offs and it's never gonna be perfect, but we, can, we try and do what we can. But if it's always gonna be wet, muddy clay soils in the spring, then maybe you are forced to burn in the fall. And well, um, also mowing management, if your soil is yeah. muddy or low and wet, you're not gonna burn in the spring. Forget about it. But usually in the fall, it's drier. We're we're really dry here right now. I don't know about you, but we can we can go into areas that are normally pretty damp right now and go in there and mow. So I don't know about if that's for many people there, because you have heavier soils. 
Well, you touched on this, Neil, but can you speak a little bit to, if you can't burn, can you talk a little bit about mowing as an alternative to burning? Absolutely. And a lot of people cannot burn, which is why I did this study, okay. mowing versus burning. <clears throat> and what we did is we burned an area in the same vegetation, the same basic composition. On the same day, we mowed a, a big area and we burned an area side by side. And then we studied the density of the various warm season grass species and the various cool season non-native prairie species, the warm season prairie grasses, big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, little blue stem, cytos grama. The cool season grasses were quack grass, Kentucky bluegrass, meadow fescue, those were the big three. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what we found was, and we mowed it as close to the ground, we had maybe an inch of stubble. And then we raked everything off to expose the soil to mimic the effects of burning, to, to heat up the soil. And it was a very dry spring, which favored both the burn and the mow because it heated up fast. And it was interesting, we measured the soil temperature and in four days, of, uh, we did this burn on, and mowing on May 1st, in four days, the surface inch soil had increased by 10 degrees centigrade. 18 degrees Fahrenheit, the top inch of the soil had increased in temperature on the burn patch in four days, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that black soil absorbs that heat okay? and, the, and the mode area was not far behind because we had raked everything off. So the soil was exposed. It didn't warm up quite as fast as the black burned area, but it was close. Okay? So that's the dynamic of favoring the warm season prairie flowers and grasses, most of which are most active in June, July, August, September. Not all, because there's some early bloomers too, but your cool season grasses and your clovers, which are your usual big problem perennial invasives, are most active in April, May, and, and early June. So if we can burn them or mow them in late April, early May, we basically truncate the first third of their growing season, which puts them at a tremendous disadvantage. And now we have changed the whole dynamic of the growing environment by, by warming up that soil, which slows down their growth because they like cool temperatures and speeds up the prairie flowers and grasses growth because most, not all, most do best under warm temperatures. Mm -hmm. So the mowing was about 50 to 60% as effective as burning in that, in that year with that vegetation on those soils on that site. Okay, so every year is different. Okay, so one year might be 50%, next year might only be 30%. Okay, but it's never as good as, as burning as far as total control and especially control of woody species because mowing doesn't get all the way down to the ground level as fire does. Okay. And that really hurts a lot of your woody species. Yeah. Um, did, that, did, that, did that answer your question? I think so. I think that helped a lot of folks out. Um, there's a, there's a, a handful of questions. Um, people are struggling with um, goldenrod, aggressive goldenrod takeover <laughs> in their meadows and creating monocultures. Can you give some advice for what to do about this? Oh, uh, I can definitely you. give you advice on this. Okay. And okay. And I can email people if they have, if I can email this to people. I hope I don't get inundated, but you can send that to Neil N E I L at Prairie Nursery, P -E R A I R I E Nursery, Neil at Prairie Nursery.com. And I will send you an email that lists all the different strategies. Okay. But well, let's talk yeah. about basically. Yeah, yeah go ahead. No, I was going to say, I always do a really great follow up with everyone who registered. So I can, I can share that with everybody because there's been a lot of questions about the golden rod. Renee, that's so, a good, I can send that to yeah. you and you can distribute it. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Perfect. That would make yeah, my yeah, life yeah. so much easier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> so if we look at, I mean, this is really interesting. The worst perennial weed, non grass weed that we have in our prairies in Wisconsin is Canada goldenrod, a native plant. It's, it creeps by rhizomes. It also spreads by seed. You can have a pristine, perfectly prepared site, beautiful prairie. It's going to find its way in there. It's in my prairie. It's in this prairie you see right here, back in the corner there, it became, it's become established. Okay. And it's really a pain to control. So if you look at how you can control it, you can go out after a rain with a dandelion digger and dig out the rhizomes. You'll never get them all the first time or the second time or the third time. You keep after them, depending on the, on the density and quantity, you can remove it, at least temporarily. But, and because the rhizomes are only two or three inches deep, so they're easy to dig up in moist soil, okay? But I'd get a dandelion digger. Don't go out there like I do. Oh, I got to dig these up with my bare hands. Probably not a good idea. Get your dandelion digger. 
and you can rip up, you can dig up the rhizomes. Okay, but you've got to get the rhizomes and they travel laterally about two inches below the soil surface. And you can rip out a lot of them in moist soil. Okay. Then I just hang them up on other plants to dry out so they die. Okay, so that's the organic method. Okay, that's one organic method. Okay. You can also come in there. What a friend of mine does is he goes and they're usually they're, they're clonal. So you have Canada goldenrod, you have tall goldenrod. Uh, you have grass leaf goldenrod. These are the three of the rhizomatous native goldenrods that we see as a problem in our region. You may have other ones in northeastern Ohio, but these are terrible because they form these clones. They creep by rhizomes and they basically suppress all the other plants in these clones. So if you have big clones, digging out the rhizomes is a fool's errand. It's going to take you forever. But if you go out with a, um, a broadleaf herbicide to kill them, you spray that, you're going to kill the other flowers. Okay, so you can't just go out there willy-nilly and spray them, assuming that you're okay with using herbicides. Okay, so uh, if you really want, <laughs> you really want to exercise, you can crawl around on the ground and cut the stems at the ground, and then dab a couple of drops of concentrated glyphosate, like 40% glyphosate, on that cut stem, or a broadleaf herbicide specifically designed for for killing Santa Okay, that's a lot of work, and it's a lot. It's hard on your knees because I've done it. Okay. A friend of mine goes out and he bundles these groups, like maybe 10 stems together with, with little twine. And then he has a little, one of those little plant mister bottles that you would normally put water in. And he puts a broadleaf herbicide in it and he just sprays. He puts it on stream, not on mist, because if you put it on mist, then you have this aerosol that can spread onto, float onto your nearby desirable prairie flowers. He puts it on stream and he just saturates the leaves, not quite saturates, but sprays it on those leaves in that bundle and just inside of the bundle so it goes into the leaves in that bundle that he's bundled together that works pretty well okay the fourth method for large areas and a client of mine figured this out this is the dr david atwell method and this is a miracle and i've had other people do this and it works it's a two-year process you can have a prairie that's got a lot of canada goldenrod and assuming that the prairie plants are still living underneath the canopy of that canada goldenrod or whatever rhizomatous clonal goldenrod that you have you go out in mid-June and you mow it at about six inches. The, the goldenrod will be approximately 18 to 24 inches usually. So you're going to knock off most of the goldenrod leaves. Yes, you're going to knock back prairie plants too. It's going to be ugly. Okay. But the prairie plants are perennials. Most of them, almost all of them, they'll come back. Okay. okay. Then in usually late August, early September, depending on the time of year, when the goldenrod is in full bloom, you go and mow it again at 12 to 18 inches. And wh why 12 to 18? Because you want to mow right below the lowest green leaves of that goldenrod on the stem. Because the goldenrods, these clone goldenrods, lose their lower leaves as the summer progresses. So you set your mower so it's just below the first green leaf as you go up the stem. And so now you just have a brown stick. You have now removed all of the photosynthetic material that that plant is using at its most vulnerable time, when it's sending all the energy up from its roots to make those flowers, you're really whacking it and it has no green leaves to recover. So now it is really messed up. You do this double mowing once in June at six inches, once in, in late August, early September, when it's in full bloom at 12 to 18 inches, you do that two years in a row and you can essentially eliminate Canada goldenrod. I couldn't believe it. I saw it with my own eyes and I told my client, I said, David, You've got Canada goldenrod in your fence row. You need to get rid of that. It's going to invade your prairie. He didn't listen. He didn't kill it. <laughs> he invaded his prairie. And he just went out and did this. Wow. Now, he's he's an oncologist. So he uses, he's like head of radiation treatment. So he knows how to treat cancer. Well, he figured out the goldenrod cancer. <laughs> without, radi without chemotherapy, purely organic with his mower. I mean, it's absolutely pure genius. And it wow. works. And I've told this to many people and they've gone out and replicated this to your treatment and they have had almost 100% control of the can of goldenrod. The prairie plants, yes, they get whacked, but they come back. Okay. So there's an amazing treatment, the Dr. Great. David Atwell, and it, it and, really works. And I will share that out with everyone then tomorrow. I'll that send you the, great. Yeah. I'll send you an email that has yeah. all this information, all the options, and then you can distribute it. Okay. Perfect. I think, you know, this, is, this is really a super helpful yeah uh, thing to do okay. so there's there's a handful of just very um plant specific questions i'm going to run by you neil um, someone asked is it okay to leave non-native rubus in the meadow um so I, i'm not uh, what would be the non 
native fruit was like some um, some blackberry or, or raspberry from some other. That you know, my my, my second my second worst weed in my prairie is native rubus, blackberries, <laughs> and they're rhizomatous, and they're just terrible. So between the canna goldenrod and the rubus, those are my two. And I, as long as I burn every other year, I can keep out common buckthorn. I can keep out tartarian honeysuckle. I can keep out autumn olive almost exclusively. The third most difficult plant is black walnut, okay. because the squirrels plant them in my prairie. Oh, okay. And I've had we've had some years where there was a burn bin because it was too dry, and there was other other years when it's snowing when I want to burn or raining and it's too wet. And I had I went three in one case four years without burning, and the squirrels must have had, must have been a bumper crop of black walnut, and they planted black walnuts all over my prairie. And after a black walnut tree has grown two years, you won't kill it with fire. Okay. So I was on the hands and knees cutting the stems at the ground in the fall putting the herbicide on the cut stem it took like a couple of days. It was horrible. If I'd been able to burn every other year, I would have kept it under control. So my worst weeds are Canagolorad, Rubus, and Black Walnut. It's crazy. Okay. All the other guys with a burning re regimen, I can keep them out pretty well. All the cool season grasses, they're pretty well under control. Even smooth brome, which is a real problem. Okay. But um, that's it's a, it's a native plant center, my problem. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. No, so I don't know. I don't know much about non-native rubus. I'm sorry. So yeah, okay. But I guess it comes down to what you want. Now realize that I have rubus in my prairie. It doesn't take well. It doesn't suppress other plants. Okay, so it's a pretty good. You know, it doesn't form these huge giant clones. Okay, it mm -hmm. can in some cases. It can be real problematic. Most people don't like it because it's not user friendly. So you're walking through your prairie and it rips you up. Okay. If it gets really thick, then it is a problem. And now you're seeing a decrease in the plants that you would like. In my prairie, it's scattered. I mean, it's there, there's plenty of it, but it's it's moving around. So they're a couple of feet apart. So they're not really suppressing the other plants. So I tolerate it. And okay. it produces high value food for wildlife. Okay. For sure. I mean, it's like poison ivy. Birds love the seeds. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Is it bad? I don't know. You tell me. Is it good? Is it bad? Yes, it is. <laughs> Prickly ash. Okay, uh, prickly ash. Okay, well, if you want giant swallowtail butterflies, you need prickly ash. Okay, so are you going to put up with prickly ash? I got piles of prickly ash on my property. Some places I cut it out because it rips my clothes apart and rips my skin apart. Other areas I leave it for the giant swallowtails. And I've got giant swallowtails probably because I've got prickly ash because that's their host plant. So, yeah, you know, there is no right or wrong in ecology, merely consequences. Right. Only con <laughs> merely consequences. So, and sometimes it's just a test run to see how aggressive something's going to be in your garden. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, listen, Neil, I'm going to wrap this up for for today. Um, any anyone out there that didn't get your questions answered, we'll get to you maybe over email over the next couple of days. I'll I'll see if Neil is available to answer a couple of these questions, um, sure. and I'll get back to you. And otherwise, I wish everyone a, a nice evening here. And Neil, I thank you so much for sharing with us. And, um, well, Renee, it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a presenter to your group, and I hope this was helpful you. for people as they figure out what the best methods are for them to manage their prairies and gardens for optimizing habitat. So thank you. Sounds great. Thank you, Neil. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.